Hey, Creep Cult, welcome to your weekly bonus episode. We're continuing with our alphabet roulette, and this week talking about Knock at the Cabin. Knocking at my cabin like you wanted me, calling me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, Shyamalan. <laughs> All After right, the so four horsemen of the apocalypse and shit. Directed and written by Manite Shemalian and Steve Desmond, also part of the screenplay with Michael Sherman, based on a book by Paul Tremblay, which you'll have a little bit more to say about that. That book is called Cabin at the End of the World, and the stars are Dave Bautista, Leonard, Jonathan Groff, Ben Aldridge, Nikki Amuka Bird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Kristen Cooey, mm-hmm. Abby Quinn, and mm-hmm. Rupert Grint. Oh, Rupi. Oh, the old Grint. Yeah, so a basic plot of this movie, if you don't know, family is at a cabin in the woods, classic, and these four people show up and tell them that they have to murder one of their group in order to stop the apocalypse. Pretty classic premise, right? Well, you won't expect what happens next. Um, yeah, so I know you... <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, first question that I have for you guys: Which title do you think is better, the original book title or the the re the re night Shyamalan title? Um, I like Knock at the Cabin. Knock at the Cabin. I feel like that's more ominous because it could be anything. Like Cabin at the End of the World. I don't know. It sounds like wasn't there a movie like Friend for the End of the World or something? With Seeking Steve Seeking a friend yeah, for the so End of the World. Yeah. That's like kind of, it kind of sounds. And then like I think it could the, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think has like the diner at the end end of the world or whatever, where yeah. it's like the edge of the universe or something. Um, I like that. Kevin. What about you? I'm indifferent about the name. I think that it's. I think that it's fine. I think that it, it <laughs> achieves what it needs to achieve. Um, it doesn't feel like, aside from the fact that it exists that this conversation exists in a cabin, it doesn't feel like it really matches. But also, cabin at the end of the world. It's a doesn't, mouthful. Yeah, doesn't too really, much. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. Drop the all of it. Just yeah. something else. Just cabin. <laughs> so, John, had you seen this already? Because I, I know we not. saw this in, in the theater separately, but equally. And um, <laughs> what were your thoughts on a first viewing? Uh, first viewing, I, I felt like it does a really great job of building tension. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like uh, Batista is a fantastic actor. He's proven time and time again that he is the best to come from the, uh, the wrestling, wrestling turned, circuit. Yeah. circuit. Um, he is a better actor than he ever was a wrestler, which is fantastic for us because he's in a lot of good shit that we enjoy. Uh, <clears throat> some of the performances are a little one note, um, but overall, it's a it's a decent ride. Um, I feel like the ending could left some things to be desired. I feel like they could have gone in different directions and maybe made a more impactful ending or something that would have let let you go home and think about some shit after the movie was over but overall it's a decent movie it's uh i mean aside from maybe like split it's just as good if not a little better than just about every other late period shamal shamalian piece (laughs) yeah and i think that's something that that affects is gonna affect a lot of people's opinion of this movie because everybody is Everybody is is like kind of waiting for that movie that really puts Shyamalan back in the good graces that he was back in his you know Heyday. first three or four movies. I feel like that was split, right? People split. were really excited, well, and then in my mind and and in the mind of a lot of um, Shyamalan fans that I've that I've um, like listened to stuff with, they see those as like they're the two. Those are two like separate phases of his career. So he had like his. Um, his sixth sense through like lady in the water like lady in the water was when that ended and then he had like some shit there and then yeah his like second re you know phase and reawakening was basically split through his current stuff mm-hmm. i mean i've just been a mixed bag but he's had at least split was good some people liked old i thought it was awful but i didn't, um, like it I didn't even get didn't even give it an <laughs> opportunity glass to watch was it. terrible um was not a fan of glass so um, this was a pleasant surprise while i didn't you also do the visit being, yeah, and I liked the visit, oh, but it yeah, it yeah. felt like kind of an experiment on his part. But it was cool to see him go back to the low budget, and I'm happy to see that that continues to be the trend that he seems to be going for. Is like let's shoot in one location, whether it's a beach that makes you old or a cabin that gets knocked at. You know, <laughs> uh, we keep it simple, we keep the budget low, we keep it to like a small cast of characters. My concern was going to be with the ending because obviously he's known for his twists, and the twist in old to me was awful. It felt like it was just so tacked on. And yeah. almost unnecessary. This one, 
I guess, you know, we're going to obviously get into spoilers. There's yeah. no twist. And maybe that's to the detriment. I think maybe you would have liked a little bit of ambiguity because it's pretty clear that what they did stopped the apocalypse. And so maybe you wanted it to us not be so sure, like us kind of, you know, is the top sp- still spinning or is it did it wobble? You know what I mean? Either there or, like, do the ballsy thing and have them... Make it a lot darker. Yeah, have, have, the, have the ending be that uh, they were too late. Yeah. yeah. So that gets into an interesting conversation because I totally agree. And on a rewatch, I found this movie to be pretty boring hmm. um only because i think it pulls most of its punches uh when it comes to the violence it does cut away it and does. just show you away. swinging implements but no contact. or it's out of focus in the background um, it's kind of like what we were talking about jennifer's body last week and i was like are we fucking finding parallels to that and cabin in the woods yeah and then <laughs> all, knock at the cabin. yeah and then all of the um apocalypse shit is mostly just seen through tv news reports which is how it is in the book um but in a book i think that functions better in a movie um and especially since Shyamalan kind of has a bad track track record with over delivering exposition through news segments the happening is notorious for having like the news um, segment of the guy getting eaten by the lions um, um what i mean shit literally the end of split the twist in that is like you know bruce willis watching a news segment saying this is what happened with the beast and all well, that. even signs yeah and signs has it's, that i mean that's a very effective one of it, the more, it's, most effective I uses think, of that i think ever, he, but... he he went to the well for the first time there and then has just been like, it worked really well. Everybody said, yeah, let's start pumping that bitch. <laughs> and it's been empty for a little while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it's still. Just, it's p- <laughs> yeah. Everything, everything just feels too safe, including the ending where it's like, and now I'm going to spell out that it was the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I also then didn't I'm like that to, the first time either. Yeah. And then it's like, and then also uh, uh, Jonathan Groff had a vision of the future and shows exactly if, you know, things are going to be okay and you're going to be safe and we're going to end with you know casey and the sunshine band and all that and i was like if you were gonna pull the punches from the rest of it you should have hit us with a a home run of a really fucked up ending to pull the rug out from under us but Shyamalan said that he purposefully like he demanded that the ending be changed from the book because he didn't want it to be as sad and ambiguous because that is oh the book book is like that so um for anyone who's listening to this and is interested, you guys included. I actually um, heard the book is not that good, so I never went and got it. Because you know me, I'll be like, oh, it's book? Yeah. Book? I will read book. And yeah. I, I heard very uh, mixed things about it. Yeah. Um, I haven't read the book, but what I did is I uh, found – it's on Spotify. There is a podcast. I'll have to find the name of it. Um, we can put it in the, sh- in the show notes or something. But um, there's a podcast where this guy <clears> – <throat> gets people like directors or writers or people who are involved in um like in classic or contemporary movies and just has them do a commentary for spot for his like spotify thing Hmm. and um he had a commentary with tremblay who wrote the novel and i was like that i've never seen that before that's really interesting um and it it was cool to hear what that process was like for him and him just commenting on like things he liked about what was changed in the movie and things he didn't like um for the most part, the book is the same. There's some of the order of some of the deaths is swapped around. And one of the biggest complaints that he had um, with the movie was that in the book, the it's very brutal. All the violence is very like explicit hmm. and described in detail because he wanted with each successive brutal killing, he wanted the your imagination of what they're going to have to do to their own family member he wants you to keep be, being reminded of like, this is why this is stuff, such a tough decision for them is because they're going to have to, you know, brutally murder somebody in their family. And so that whole thing kind of gotten taken out. And I think it takes a big amount of the punch and stakes out. I mean, obviously there are stakes, but it takes some of the impact out of this decision um, that the characters have to make. And then the ending, I know you said you're not really interested in reading the book, but I'm, I'm also fine to be spoiled if you are aware of what it is. Yeah, so basically what ends up happening is in the scene when Andrew goes to the car to get the gun, when he comes back, he ends up getting into a struggle with Leonard, and he accidentally shoots the daughter and kills her. Uh, the dad does, but uh, he she accidentally gets shot and killed during the struggle. Wow. And they say, because she wasn't a willing sacrifice, it doesn't count. Oh, my God. So then Leonard and the rest of them all, like, base all of them but Sabrina kill themselves 
and then Sabrina is like, fuck this. I don't want, like, you know, if, if basically if God's not going to take what happened to when is a sacrifice, like I'm out, I don't want to have anything to do with this. So she like helps Andrew and, um, Eric, Eric, Eric. um, daddy Eric. Yeah. Get to the car, leave. Um, and they, throughout the entire novel, they see the news reports, but they're never totally sure if the apocalypse is actually happening or whether it's like they say in the movie where they've somehow like pre-recorded this stuff or made this up or timed it and so they basically drive off ambiguously saying if the apocalypse is about to happen we'd rather do it together than give in to whatever fucked up god wouldn't count the death of our daughter as a as a sacrifice and they just basically drive off into the potentially forthcoming apocalypse saying at least we're gonna go into it together modern audiences would have fucking hated that dude. yeah fair 100 percent yeah so that's probably why it changed what i like and you mentioned the four horsemen stuff and i have a little bit about what they are and so i thought that was cool knowing more about them but i do wish that they didn't just spoon feed us all of that uh, it's like yeah we could have gotten that and that would have been fun as a viewer to kind of piece that together well and i think Shyamalan he tends to lay on the biblical spiritual themes way too heavily to where mm-hmm. it starts to feel preachy and that's kind of where this started to feel toward the end and i would have rather yeah i much would have rat much rather would have had it be um something where i go oh they could have been the four horsemen or they could have just been four crazy people and the right. yeah and the ending really doesn't give you that option to choose it just goes nope the apocalypse was happening these were the four horsemen they avoided it and now everything's fine and Tremblay actually said that he thinks that Shyamalan's ending is much darker because in his mind um, it confirms that this fucked up God does exist and that they are living in a world where there is a God who is willing to force you to kill your family member to stop the apocalypse and you just have to you just have to go on living the rest of your life knowing that that God exists and that he's a piece yeah. of shit i didn't think about that yeah so to him he was like on an existential you know <laughs> level it's much scarier than mine where you're kind of unsure if the apocalypse was ever real and if the whole sacrifice thing was actually going to stop anything you know it's like you can choose your own adventure there <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i want to talk a little bit about the four horsemen there's the white horseman which obviously was leonard batista's character um some translations make it seem like it could be jesus christ or like a representation of the Holy Spirit. Others say it's the Antichrist. So that could go either way. But looking at his character in that lens, I think is interesting because he is very calm and very collected and kind of kind of a nice guy for the most part. Like he tries his best to be mm-hmm. kind of loving to everybody. And so I thought that that was uh, a pretty cool interpretation of that. And then we get the red one, which is War, which was Rupert Gritt's character. Which is very obvious. He's all about the violence and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then there's, let's see, the black horse, which is famine, which was I think Sabrina, and she was a cook. And I was like, yeah. Okay. So there's like subtle things that he's throwing in there, which again would have been cool to not blatantly say, but for you to you know norm know more about these character or his characters and then be able to kind of piece that together for yourself because you said that you picked up on that before the end of the movie when it was kind of spelled out like you oh you... yeah i mean come on <laughs> but see on the other hand i didn't because i'm terrible at that kind of stuff and yeah, really? um so i i don't think you are well, well i mean definitely times when you're like i saw that coming a mile away yeah just in this case i didn't think it was going to be like a biblical thing even though it's about the apocalypse i was i guess maybe like part of me was hoping it wasn't going to go in that direction because you just the kept hearing... horsemen of the apocalypse is such an overdone oh, like yeah, obvious yeah. thing you just keep hearing egg porkalypse in your head instead <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then the fourth one is the pale horse which pale the the word that it is used in translation could mean like yellow which is why she was wearing yellow well and i do think that that like his use of color which has always been and that's, sorry that's supposed to be death yeah so i mean that's really cool and i like that and that's why yeah again i think it's something where we could have picked up on that without having it spelled out but um i do love the use of color because just like in most of his stuff uh, Shyamalan stuff color is hugely important every m- one of his movies you watch there's some theme of like a certain character wears certain colors and it means a certain thing in this like the way that the inside of the cabin is painted it's all blue and I don't know for sure what the meaning behind that was supposed to be it's obviously very intentional because it's kind of a weird um, color for this whole cabin to be in my mind it was either that it's supposed to have kind of a 
calming effect against the violence that's happening, which makes sense with the way that Leonard's character kind of has that combo of like, he's this, he's this disarming kind person who has to commit these violent acts. Then my other thought was, I know back in art school, we talk about, you know, blue is almost always used when it comes to the Virgin Mary and that like immaculate conception idea and that innocence. And so then today my head started spinning out into like, oh, maybe this is kind of a, uh, modern day joseph and mary baby in the manger like this is the stable and this is the baby that they didn't actually birth but you know adopted and um yeah and it's like a modern interpretation and almost like the yeah and then the portion of the apocalypse come into like the you know the sacred space of the stable so that was just kind of like me spitballing on the color in the movie but i do think the way this is shot it looks gorgeous Mm -hmm. um he shot it all with like um lenses from the 90s so that it would have the the look of a 90s thriller um and also i don't know if that came through for me it still looks great no yeah yeah yeah. but i I never was like that's a 90s story that's definitely like seven bro (laughs) to me the lighting is the most impressive part especially since i didn't know this and it totally makes sense uh, having watched it with the commentary tremblay was talking about visiting the set a couple days and how all of the interior stuff with the cabin they're on a sound stage and the whole cabin is surrounded by light banks mm-hmm. and they're just simulating you know those bars of dusk light coming through and so that Shyamalan had complete control over how all the characters were lit and everything wow. so there are scenes like when um I think it's Eric and is it Sabrina are like talking in the bathroom into the mirror mm-hmm. and just her face is like cast in light as she's talking and it gives her this kind of almost like holy figure mm-hmm. angelic look, look. Her, angelic look um so that while she's saying you know this uh, talking about these fucked up visions and stuff she is giving off this impression of a holy figure and the way they use the lighting to show the eric like yeah. and again there there's they could have played a little bit more with he's concussed so did he really see this figure of light did he not is the vision he's seeing because of his concussion um and that stuff that sounds like it's a bit more delved into in the book because Tremblay talked in the commentary about how like he uh, in like shitty pulpy crime novels the detective would always get a concussion like and then they would just wake up a few hours later and be totally fine and he was like no you can die from a concussion so (laughs) I wanted to give a character a concussion in this that like affected the way that his brain worked for the rest of the the story Um, but yeah I mean overall I think that for a Shyamalan movie it's nowhere near the bottom of the barrel for his work I do think that it is a tense functional thriller I just think it pulls most of its punches and knowing Shyamalan he can go a lot further and he can go a lot more fucked up and I think that he could have and that there was room with the material from the novel to do that Mm -hmm. and for some reason he just decided and it may be just because he's He's older now and doesn't want to make stuff that's as depressing, but he really could have pushed it a little bit further, and I think it would have been a lot more memorable and, str- and a stronger piece. But yeah, I mean, um, I I think I'm in the same place. I, I mean, it's it's a there are fun parts of it, you know, and I think that the the part where the tension is really at its peak is just them inside the cabin having the conversations you know people are standing around holding weapons the dialogue is very pointed everyone's you know at different like emotional states like you like it's the the fact that like Rupert Grint's character is like you know angry this entire time and it's just like like oh they're not gonna fucking believe you and all this other shit while Leonard is trying to like get the rest of the group to kind of go through with his plan and his spiel. Um, And like, so it's the infighting part and then the constant, like while they're bickering, are they going to find a way to escape, to go to the car, to get the gun? Like the tension part works really, really well. Yeah. And I'm glad that you brought that up because I, yeah, I mean, there's, there are just so many cool ideas here that I I almost wish the movie had been like a little uh, better. Well, or, or even just like, you know, two hours long you know i don't usually ask for a movie to be longer but (laughs) i think we're all kind of in that boat yeah but i you know i really like that idea of these people aren't like these zealots that from some cult that you would usually expect who are preaching the end times they're these people who as far as we know are just normal people who have started suddenly being plagued by these visions and they've all been kind of uh forced to come together and they all talk about how like this is the first time they've met and they don't all really trust each other or really know much about each other and they're just on this divine mission and throughout the movie 
they're faltering and having different opinions on how they should, you know, and basically, yeah, he, uh, Batista is like trying to keep this thing together. So it's like, even it's like, so there's their internal struggle of trying to pull this off. And then the whole time the family is having to watch them and be like, why the fuck should we trust you if you guys aren't even trusting each other? You, you don't even have this shit worked out, like your whole plan or whatever. Um, and you actually reminded me that Tremblay's entire inspiration for this story was he he said that he had he was sick of seeing home invasion stories he felt like they had been way overdone and his wife said to him how like how weird would it be if there was a home invasion where the invaders break in and then they start killing themselves and he was like cool i need to figure out a story that (laughs) that explains why that would happen and like he's like that's a really cool twist on the home invasion idea is like they just come in and start murdering themselves with crazy weapons yeah um once and they even mentioned the whole apocalypse thing around it they even mention in like towards the end of the movie this wasn't a home invasion like it's like literally a piece of the dialogue which is interesting yeah and i think also um it's just really you know as much as i've said that there were things where i you know feel like punches were pulled i do think that this movie would not work at all without the performances and while some of them do feel a little bit you know i mean it's Shyamalan, so so, uh, i think a lot of it's in the writing and the directing a lot of it feels like they're not real people but uh batista i think jonathan groff uh who's the actor that plays andrew um and the 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 little girl that played when the little girl plays when is fantastic um so many great child act i just rewatched evil dead rise a couple days ago and um is it out streaming now hmm? Nice. And I and I wanted to show it on, to my sister. On what? Right now I think it's for um for rent for like oh, okay. Okay. VOD. Yeah, VOD. Uh, ben VOD Aldridge played Andrew. Ben Aldridge. Yeah, I thought all of their performances were fantastic and, and Kristen, I think Cooey. Yeah. Um and I love Jonathan Groff, just, you know, R. I. P. Mind Hunter, but um yeah, I, I think without those performances this would not have worked at all. So props to them, and Batista was pulled specifically because of his performance in Blade Runner 2049. Shyamalan. Oh, you were just talking about that last week? Yeah, yeah, Shyamalan saw that and went, I did not realize, because he was like, how am I ever going to find a person who's a giant, brutish-looking person with, like, a, a teddy bear's soul? Like, somebody that you feel like you could trust despite all of his tattoos and all that stuff. And he saw that 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 short, like, couple-minute performance in mm. Blade Runner and went and just called up Batista and Batista That's was the fucking guy. Yeah, yeah. And even Batista was like, I don't know if I can do this. And he was like, you can do it. I, I, you're, you're, you're good. I, I done watched you do it already. Yeah, he does. And he, I, he's fan- from the moment he's on screen. I was like, yep, you got this. It was rad. One other thing I wanted to mention, I thought was cool. As far as the four horsemen idea goes, they have to break the seven seals. When he knocks at the door, he knocks seven times. And I was like, that's cool. But again, these little nods, that could have been a really cool thing for us to put together. Yeah. Instead of having it spoon fed to us. And you yeah. know, I'm a, big fan of not doing that <laughs> yep just classic uh, uh theater audience hand holding but yeah um exactly i guess uh, i read this in the imdb trivia some movie theaters when you would go to see this would have a little thing that said uh you know it was like an envelope that said make your choice like give your sacrifice and basically you could choose to put your phone into a sealed envelope and like sacrifice the thing you love for the duration of the movie and if you kept the envelope sealed and brought it back out at the end you would get some sort of like little you know themed prize or whatever that's tight and i'm like i don't know what these must be like la theaters and stuff like that that are doing these cool things but um i was like that's that's cute i like that i would be fine if they just did that all the time and i mm-hmm. didn't get a prize after <laughs> yeah the yeah. prize is that nobody fucking interrupted my movie with their dumbass phones exactly yeah all right cool well i think that wraps it up on that discussion i thought that was great you guys uh so i'm really happy that we got to watch that and kind of dive into it yeah let's see what's next on the wheel of endless possibility yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> we're moving on to l i went with the lost boys this week john so then i went with little shop of horrors yeah yeah and anthony you went with looper, looper. ryan johnson's yeah. looper all let's right kind of a, a cool mixed bag let's hit a spin yeah, yeah spin right ways. round baby right round like a looper baby right round 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 Ooh. little shop oh, oh i'm so excited you're talking about which one which one which one come, come on. on baby Come on, Seymour. The Rick Moranis. Okay. Come on. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to be watching the Rick Moranis musical version directed by Frank Oz, Yoda himself. I'm so excited. And uh, it's great. <laughs> I'm stoked. 
Well, so I, I knew that. I thought Corman wasn't involved, but he did the original one. And I was, but even the this isn't, one feels like a Corman. Isn't the original Jack? Uh, doesn't have Jack Nicholson? I don't know. I think it might. Yeah, I think it does. And Bill Murray's in the Moranis one, right? Doesn't he play like a dentist yeah. or something? Yeah. yeah. No, okay. no, he goes to the dentist. Oh, he goes to, to the like, dentist. Yeah. Get to get off on the bay. <laughs> He's yeah. a little weird. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, anyway. tune in for that. Yeah, I'm really excited. I love that movie, and I've only seen it once, so I'm excited to revisit it. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's what we're talking about next week. Join us. And if you have not already wa- or watched or listened to our regular episode, do that. We're talking about Princess Mononoke. Yeah. Super excited. So we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Keep it creepy.